Yes. Mas por que? Vamos ao cachorro. Ok, men, três pães. Mary Chabala is a farmer in northern Zambia. Not long ago, she and her husband Barnabas were among the more prosperous farmers in their village. Now they're destitute, victims of a plague that threatens to transform this part of the world. Like nearly 30 million others living in sub-Saharan Africa, Barnabas and Mary are infected with the HIV virus that causes AIDS. They're too sick to continue farming, so the task of growing food now falls to their 11-year-old son, Wisdom, and his young cousins, orphaned by the AIDS pandemic. More than ever before, it's children who are left to bear the responsibility of agriculture, and as a result, when a parent dies from AIDS, yields fall by up to 50%. <laughs> When we were healthy, we used to grow a lot of crops and support many family members who came to live with us. But now, since we've been sick, things have become much more difficult. We had to sell everything we own to buy food and to pay for our medical expenses. Across southern Africa, rain doesn't always fall where or when it should. And cycles of drought and crop failure, aggravated by poverty and ineffective government policies, have contributed to occasional food shortages. But now, with the number of HIV infections rising daily, there is a new and different food crisis on the horizon. If it was simply another period of hunger, which is cyclical in Southern Africa, you could get over it, you, you get some food supplements over time, you recover. But what everyone is observing now is that even when there is some marginal recovery because you get rains and the crops come and, 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 and the landscape flourishes and there's food, Nonetheless, the, the families everywhere are ill. If you do the maths, one person is dying every four or five minutes from AIDS. So as you begin to add those figures up, it, it's impacting throughout society. It is, as we say, it's affecting the very fabric of society. In a country like Zambia, nearly 80% of the population is involved in agriculture, very small-scale agriculture. So when you have uh, these high prevalence rates of, of uh, HIV, up to up to 20 percent, and in some some areas higher, of course it affects uh, immediately the food supply of these very people who are producing. So the fact that a lot of people are subsistence farmers means that the impact is so much larger. <laughs> The highest rate of HIV infection is among young adults between the ages of 15 and 49. These are the agricultural workers whose small farms fed families and villages. And when added together, entire countries. Since 1985, more than 7 million farmers have died from AIDS in the worst-hit regions, striking at the heart of agriculture. Barnabas once grew enough food to support a household of 10 people. Now he relies on the generosity of neighbours to feed his family. Only 10 years ago, before the AIDS pandemic moved into rural communities, life expectancy in Zambia was 52 years of age. Now it's fallen below 40. Okay, okay, okay. 
A bowl of cornmeal is all his neighbours have to offer. Not much to sustain a body weakened by AIDS. AIDS, poverty and hunger create a vicious spiral. As Barnabas and Mary's situation worsens and the amount of food they have to eat dwindles further, progression of the disease is accelerated. When people are malnourished, they don't have the strength to withstand infection. So through that, the, the disease develops much easier. Uh, opportunistically, the infections come much faster. People can't uh, actually recover so, so easily. So through that, the whole onset of, of uh, full-blown AIDS is, is accelerated. In Zambia, as with most African countries, there are few resources to treat AIDS patients. Barnabas has to travel 20 kilometers to reach the nearest health clinic after Mary takes a sudden turn for the worse. But all the clinic worker has to offer are basic medicines, like these salts meant to combat dehydration antiretroviral drugs which have transformed AIDS into a chronic condition in Western countries aren't available here. We've been taught about antiretroviral drugs and things like that but we've never handled them and we've never seen them in the big towns. Even in terms of mother-child transmissions we know that we, they're supposed to be using that but we don't have it here. In the rural areas, it is unrealistic to think that we are going to be able to provide the drugs that are needed in the combination that is required with the monitoring, medical monitoring that is needed uh, to people who normally don't even have access to a simple aspirin. Food is the first medicine for people living with HIV AIDS. And once people are properly fed, then the ARV drugs can help them. <laughs> When people have good nutrition, they can live longer, they can live better, and they can, through that, also sustain their family much longer. But food is also the only currency subsistence farmers have, and the first thing sacrificed when someone is sick. When doctors could do nothing more to help Josephine Muenya, she traveled 200 kilometers to seek the advice of this traditional healer. While herbal remedies can help with HIV-related infections, some less scrupulous healers exploit superstitions and despair. Looking into a mirror, this one tells Josephine he can see what ails her, as well as the enemy who has cursed her, both of which he can treat for a price. Depending on what she's suffering from, we could have to pay more than 100,000 kwacha. If he discovers that she's been bewitched, we'll probably have to pay more than 200,000 kwacha. Does it mean you'll have to sell all of your harvest to pay for the treatment? <laughs> it will take more than that. HIV AIDS awareness is growing across southern Africa. But as food shortages increase, many migrate in search of jobs, and the virus spreads. I think the numbers are so high because you have so many trading routes, so much migration, labor migration, country to country, people to work in the mines who move from one country to another, so many highway corridors, so many truckers moving from country to country. The Southern Africa is just a vortex of shifting people. And on top of that, you have the cultural reality of gender inequality. Women have no capacity to say no to sexual overtures. They can't tell a man to wear a condom. They, they, are, they are subject to predatory male sexual behavior, intergenerational sex, older men, younger women. So these cultural attitudes are deeply, deeply entrenched and it takes time to change behavior.
Women are the agricultural backbone of African society. They're also the population group with the highest incidence of HIV infections. Pauline Chazakwa has recently been widowed. Gladys Muonga has also just lost her husband. Pauline and Gladys are two of five women who were married to the same man. Then, six months ago, he died. Of his five widows, one has died and two others have moved away, leaving Pauline and Gladys responsible for 15 children. All they have to eat are the foods they can grow. Staying on the land is essential to their survival. But in this part of southern Zambia, women can't inherit property. So the only way a widow can stay on the land is if she is inherited by a male member of her dead husband's family. Traditionally, what used to happen was, uh, like for example, my, uh, my, my uncle passed away. And then uh, if I have to take over the family together with the wives, then uh, I have to marry, in fact. It, is, it was such that it was a marriage. We could, we could even continue with the production of children, if you like. <laughs> yes. Now AIDS is changing the way people think about this custom. Green McCombwe has decided not to inherit his uncle's widows, nor to take part in sexual cleansing, a practice involving sexual intercourse that is believed to break the bond between a widow and her dead spouse's spirit. As the situation is like in Zambia, uh, we have this uh, pandemic disease and uh, everybody now has known the consequences of that disease, such that uh, we are not free the only the only far we can go is to assist, but uh, on marrying or taking over the marriage completely, that one is a bit skeptical. We can't go ahead with that one. While changes like this can help stem transmission of the HIV virus, they can also leave women more vulnerable. In some communities, when a man dies it's customary for relatives to take what they want, even if that means leaving women and children destitute. We used to plow from that tree up to the village. When my husband died, all the land was taken away. Some of his relatives came along and said they wanted to plow here, that this was their land and we had to stop using it. Since we are one family, I don't think there's anything wrong here. We are just sharing. We are not grabbing land. It's just a normal way. They took many things from us. For example, they took our plow. It was the only one we had. So it's become very difficult because we have nothing else to use and we have a large family to feed. Most of the attention in the HIV AIDS uh, crisis has been on, on the medical aspects of, of HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS is a disease and it has always been dealt with as, as a disease as such. So people are looking at ways of prevention, they're looking at, uh, at treatment. Um, but very little attention has been paid uh, to all the food security aspects, how people cope with the impact of the disease on their lives. For a lot of women, coping can mean putting yourself at greater risk of being infected by the HIV virus. If I find 10 or more men who would like to sleep with me, that is a good day. If I'm unlucky, there will be only one. 
Since her parents' death, 19-year-old Macy has worked as a prostitute to support two younger brothers. If I'm offered enough money, I won't use condoms because what I need most is the money. People who have access to food don't need to go out and sell their body to be able to eat. So if women, if widows, if orphans have possibilities of getting food, possibilities of producing their own food, of buying their own food, then they are not in the situation in having to engage in risky behavior just to be able to eat. Food security in itself is a means of prevention. One way to increase food security is to help people improve their crop yields in spite of cycles of drought or labor shortages. Harriet Kaluwao is a widow with eight children. Four years ago, she began using a simple technique known as conservation farming. Now she plants her maize in pits instead of conventional rows. And as a result, she harvests a third more maize using less costly fertilizers and less water. But techniques like this one are slow to take hold. And as another drought strangles crops in southern Zambia, AIDS households have one third less income to cushion the blow. The moment you have a drought, it means there's crop failure. So households will be seen selling livestock, goats, chickens, to go and buy the, the food they needed. But now because of the increased pressure as a result of HIV AIDS, most money is needed for health expenses and at times funeral expenses. We don't know how we are going to get by. We've never seen a drought like this before. We can't plant enough and now it is the end of the season. So we don't know what we are going to do. People because of HIV AIDS, um, they're capacity to actually cope with the drought has been undermined and in that sense I think it's a drought which um, or a crisis which will come back. Many believe the real crisis is yet to come when millions of children orphaned by AIDS take up their responsibilities as adults. In neighboring Mozambique the streets of Shimoyo overflow with orphans. Some survive in small gangs Others are exploited as a cheap source of labor. What do you do when you've never had nurturing or love or affection as a child as you're growing up because your parents have died when you're very young? What happens when you have your own children? How do you bring them up? What happens when you're bewildered and angry and enraged by the circumstances of life and you act out or you become delinquent? 15 or 20 years down the road, God alone knows the destabilizing effects of these kids. In just a few decades, many countries in southern Africa will be left in the hands of children like these. But with no one to teach or guide them, how much can they be expected to contribute when they're older? Since his parents' death, 14-year-old Soleil has been responsible for his sister and two brothers. One of them, Elias, is just six years old. Providing care is something Soleil is accustomed to. He also nursed his parents before they died. First, it was the father who was sick. He had a bad cough, so we took him to the hospital. Then the mother started getting sick. She had the same symptoms. She was coughing and had diarrhea. She went to a relative's home, and soon after, she died. As terrible as it's been, Soleil's battle with AIDS isn't over yet. Yes, of course. He has the same condition as his parents. 
He's not been tested at the hospital, but we are sure, since he has all the same symptoms. Orphan-headed households are entirely new. It never happened before in history that children simply did not have anywhere to go to, that they did not have any adult to turn to when they had lost their own parents. And traditionally, African societies have ways of taking care of orphans. They're immediately put into another household. Nowadays, there simply are no more households to put the orphans in. Shimoyo is a community of 200,000 people. It also has one of the highest HIV infection rates in Mozambique, and every day approximately 15 children are left orphaned. We were already working in the community with AIDS patients when it became clear that there was an even greater problem with the orphans they were leaving behind. We realized we had to change our approach. Until that moment, only church groups were getting involved. Now we needed help from the entire community. Just as a crisis of this magnitude can pull communities apart, it can also bring them together. As the number of HIV infections escalated in Shimoyo, Kubat Sirana, an association of church groups, began mobilizing community support and recruiting volunteers. One of the first stumbling blocks was food. Volunteers were often as poor as the people they were trying to help. So Kubat Sirana began planting gardens, some growing food for widows, some for orphans, others food for the volunteers themselves. One special garden was created for medicinal plants that AIDS patients could grow themselves and use to treat common AIDS-related conditions. The governments and even international organizations haven't been able to, to provide the kind of support that local people need. I think it's important to realize that these organizations are there, that they need support. They need support to do better. They need support to expand their activities, to replicate it in, in other places. Soleil receives some food assistance from volunteers. Even so, he and his siblings are among the most vulnerable groups in society, with few opportunities to become self-supporting in the future. Like so many orphans, Soleil's parents died before they could pass on generations of knowledge about farming, crop varieties and tools. Multiplied by millions of AIDS orphans across southern Africa, it's not hard to understand why the current food crisis won't go away when the rains finally come. The orphans that are being left behind don't have enough agricultural knowledge to be able to continue agricultural work and to be able to uh, produce food. We're looking at how uh, knowledge that is kept usually at the community level but is lost because parents are dying before they can transmit that knowledge to the children can be kept and can be kept for future generations. At the Mansa orphanage in Zambia, volunteers are working to change the future, to avert mass starvation by teaching orphans the skills their parents can't. how to grow food, the importance of working together, a sense of hope. Even so, with forecasts predicting 20 million AIDS orphans in Africa by the end of this decade, the challenges are daunting. The United Nations family has to be vastly more mobilized than it is now. Because if ever there was a time of truth for the United Nations, if ever there was a test for its entire rationale, it's in the fact 
that a disease which can't be cured is wrecking havoc everywhere in all the countries which are member nations of the United Nations and those of us who serve those member countries have to give voice and expression to this monstrosity which would galvanize the world. Capitalism must be guided by ethics and morality and care for the people. The question is, what kind of economic development are we pushing for Mexico? What are our needs?